Man, the Dodgers teed the Giants last night. They almost lost it, too. If Sacks hadn't hit that luggage run home in the night, couch it, Bill. Oh, I'm a fat old Desert Streisand fan anyway, but her son movies absolutely candles. And you learned, Miss Larry. Hold all my calls, Cindy. Okay, <laughs> what? Hold all my calls. Sure, Mr. Thunder. Tim <laughs> Waffle. I am sure we have all felt like that as we are learning a new language. We don't have the words, we don't understand the words. It's very frustrating. So, this presentation is really about helping students connect better to words so that they can better understand and communicate with other people. And this presentation is piecing together the communicative puzzle with vocabulary. It's my evolution um, to teaching vocabulary to better connect the interpretive and interpersonal pieces of language building with brain-based learning um, to take the students beyond novice high. Over the years, I have really started looking at brain-based research and how students better learn. Um, and one of the things that I've learned is that oftentimes what we hold as truth is fiction and what we hold as fiction may be truth. Just like a couple things here. Do adults learn languages better than children? So, Instinct and what we hear from other people is that children learn better, but that is not true. Adults can learn better. If you, could, if you dropped me and a child of five years old into France and we both had the same amount of time, we didn't have to work, the adult would learn better. Children are more fearless and children have more time, which makes their learning another language a bit easier. Um, but in the same circumstances, the adult would do better. They might not have as good pronunciation, but they would learn faster. Secondly, this font is better than this font for student learning. That is incorrect. A font that is a little harder to read is better for student learning because it makes their brain work more. How about students who test more often rate their classes lower than classes that test less frequently? Well, the truth there is that students who test more frequently rate their classes higher at the end of the semester because they believe they have learned more. What about at the end? Multitasking decreases learning. That is true. Our brains function better focusing on one thing at a time. I would recommend reading Brain Rules and Make It Stick. These two books really have helped me think about what I do in class and what is going to help my students take learning into long-term memory. From Brain Rules, um, this book really looks at um, putting things into memory, a lot like exercise. Um, things need to be novel to remember. Um, we need to do it uh, multiple times, but we won't learn a lot if it's boring. Um, we won't learn a lot if we're trying to do many things at the same time. And we won't learn a lot if we're trying to learn a lot of information at the same time, this is one of those ones that looks at that seven pieces of information um, for 30 seconds is about as much as our brain's gonna take, but after that it becomes harder to remember and then repeat. Um, also, we want to bring in many senses when we are teaching, such as visual, smells, um, sound, 
And from make it stick, I would say some of the big things that I learned there is that we need to interleave and have varied practice for better um, memory. Making mistakes and correcting them builds a bridge to advanced learning. Um, also, make it stick really talks a lot about constantly assessing students. Not giving them that big high stakes testing, but people who do not quiz themselves on what they know generally overestimate what they know, according to the research. Um, quizzing is a better tool for learning than measuring learning. Quizzing is a better tool than just reviewing your notes. So recalling over and over um, is more important as it helps us interrupt the process of forgetting. We want to practice retrieval to make learning stick better. So we want to do that rather than just have re-exposure to the original um, material. We need both basic knowledge and creative thinking if we're going to be better at a given process. One of the problems with both students and teachers alike is that they think that mass practice gives better results. Think about practicing throwing a ball a hundred times or practicing different types of verb conjugations, but all in the present tense. And when we are testing or quizzing or assessing our students, them being required to supply an answer provides stronger learning benefits. So think about the difference of a student writing down a vocabulary word rather than picking from multiple choice. Also, using one's own handwriting is tied to uh, stronger learning benefits. And then having to write short essays on materials is stronger um, more so because there are benefits from first retrieval, later elaboration, and then reflection, generation, and creating new material inside the student's own head. And one of the biggest things I want to push here is that to learn, students need to do something. So let's look at my growth. A little evolution. When I started teaching, I wanted students to use the vocabulary in context, in class, with their classmates, so they had to get it on their own. Go home, learn all these words, all right? So we, when we get to class, we can use it, and that's the fun part of class. Look at these lists. We can study, we can study these lists. And that, that didn't seem to work so well because students would get to class and not know all the words. So I wanted to give the students multiple experiences. We wanted to have flashcards or accordiones, um, if you remember those. Then I wanted to, I grew a little bit. I connected to visuals and the senses for students to help learn vocabulary. And then there's this whole bit with recognition versus recall, which started with all the students that love to, put, to play Quizlet, which is a great tool, um, but that's a lot of, on the recognition side when you're first learning vocabulary, all right? And then there's the chunking, seven word idea. You wanna have students learn so many words at a time because they can't handle at 30 words. If you give them seven, 10 words, they're gonna learn those well. And then the next day you can give them another seven, another seven, and then another seven by the end of the week. They have all those seven times five, 35 words, rather than if you give them 35 at once to learn all week at the same time, they're gonna learn less. So let's do something. How about some interpretive reading? Let's get our brains working. All right, you need some note cards and a pen or a pencil. All right, so you're gonna use the front and back of two different note cards. All right, you're gonna read the following paragraph and choose four words you think are integral to understanding the information. Español inglés. We're gonna use English today. Ready, there will be a quiz. Here's a picture at the top of your note card. You should have a word. There you should have the top of and back of one card to have a word and another word and then the next card a word and another word. Okay. Let's go.
So let's connect the information that we're learning to what we already know. All right. Now that you have those vocabulary cards, you want to write down three words that you associate with the vocabulary word you wrote down on the same card. Three for each side. This process helps memory. Why? All right. Everybody's heard of schema. Basically, you have information in your brain and you want to connect new learning to previous learning. That ties it better together and makes it more likely that it will stay in long-term memory. I forget the internet. The slower process that comes with a mental search is more effective for remembering new word meanings. I rather than, well, I want to look for these words that are, that are attached to this new word. No, use what you already know. All right. Also, the dictionary is a little more effective than just doing a, um, a word search. I right, then give the cards to the teacher. Um, so this would be the idea for a card. You have one word, you have a related word one, and related word two, related word three. And you've done this um, four times. So let's, let's look at the text again and a few words. So here, I chose a few words. Um, so a student might have the word background and have three words that they might associate with that. You might be able to think of a couple right now. Previous, um, something that goes with lecture, reading, organize, put together, schema. And we want students to quiz themselves because if not, they overestimate what they know. So what can we do with these cards? Well, we can give short quizzes in class really quick. Take out a sheet of paper, numbers one through five, number one through 10. All right, use the information on the cards that the kids have created to give definitions. All right, this connects to the student's schemas. The students concentrate on what is being said. This improves listening skills. And then quizzing is a better to tool than reviewing. So recalling over and over helps us interrupt the process of forgetting. And finally, you can make a game out of it. How? Think about the game Taboo. This would be some of my students um, with vocabulary cards that they have made connecting a new um, word to previous learning. Um, so with that, you can see that students are, as they are looking at new vocabulary, they are also connecting that new vocabulary to previous vocabulary, especially if it wasn't a card of their own making. But as we said, that was just a game, and there are even better ways, once the students have done a better job of recalling the vocabulary, to even make it sink in more, and with the content that you're actually teaching, because we're not just teaching vocabulary, we're teaching concepts, units of information, and words to be used in a constructive, communicative matter. You're not just teaching the kids to give a list of words. So now we want to take our kids into presentational writing um, or speaking. We want them to use the words that they have been practicing with, connecting to previous learned information, and then use it to retell or summarize what they have already read. This student work to recall information will be better because it will be a retrieval practice, which is more effective because it produces better learning and remembering than reviewing alone. So can you take the words background, lecture, organize, schema, neuroeducator, networks, neuroplasticity, and accommodate to give a rewrite summary of what you read previously? Something like, give you a few seconds. Normally I would give my students about 10 minutes.
So neuroeducators, in order to accommodate information from a lecture in um, our brains, they say um, we need to use our neuroplasticity to um, accommodate the new information by organizing it with our schema and background knowledge to create new networks of learning. Something like that. But obviously the brain work that your students will be doing with this while they're looking at new words and thinking about um, information that they, they have learned from a reading, a uh, lecture, a movie, um, will help them put this knowledge in their brains, not just the new vocabulary, but the new concepts and ideas as well. So another quiz. Obviously, I'm trying to really push this idea that the assessing of students makes them do something. Making them do something helps their brains actually work. Their brains working helps them take information and put it more into their long-term memory. So here the assignment is, we want students to use the following vocabulary words to create a series of questions for a simulated dialogue about this theme. And you can imagine the students reading a different text, picking out different vocabulary words and creating questions by using um, the class content and the vocabulary to create an interpersonal activity for the class. So the students have a list of words. Perhaps when they come right into class, this is their quiz. You need to write, um, choose five of these words to create five questions to ask somebody who is interested in, in memory. Um, students might ask, how does a person's background affect how they learn new information? Um, how can we remember information better from a lecture? And then I would always ask my students to create questions that are not yes, no. So for now, perhaps you can come up with um, one or two questions, we don't have that much time here, to, um, that you might use to have a dialogue or conversation with a, another person or with your students, or perhaps that you might think your students would have with each other. So let's say you had um, 20 minutes with your students as um, an assessment at the beginning of class or at the end of class, maybe take it out the door, but it would take a while. To, writing questions takes more brain power because, and that's what we want with our students. We want them to be thinking about those words. Um, and we want to take, have them doing higher order thinking processes with those words, like the summary or the creation of questions. Um, so if we look up, you, maybe um, your questions were something like mine. How does background knowledge affect learning? In what ways do you think we can increase neuroplasticity? What is the best way to organize the information from a lecture? Explain the role of neuroeducators in schools. That's a question for you all, probably not for your students. And how do we accommodate the diversity of schema within our classes? So these are all very big questions that you could, that your students could discuss or we could discuss amongst ourselves because this article really is dedicated to educators, which is why I used it today because I thought about the whole thing of what I wanted to do today had to do with this article, the idea of using uh, brain-based research in a way that engages the students in the modes of communication as, I, as they are increasing their vocabulary toolbox. So the question really is, what can you do with these cards? Well, as we said, we can have a practice dialogue. Think about it. If you have um, 20 students that each created five questions, well, now you have 100 questions or 20 cards that you can 
interdispersed between the students where they can practice. You can also use those as an end of unit simulated conversation. Again, the content came from the students. All right. It is classroom content that you did not create. Now, that's, that's not to say you don't need to check over the cards to make sure that they are comprehensible, but it was less time on the, um, for you as a teacher to, um, to devote um, to making class questions. And it is more review of vocabulary that doesn't take the student outside of the modes of communication. Think about it. They are viewing the words, so they're interpreting, how do I use those? They are creating questions for a dialogue, so there's a bit of the presentational leading into um, interpersonal. And by engaging the three modes of communication, we are having our students do things with words. I like this. Just because you covered it, that doesn't mean they learned it. I like the brain-based research and I like the idea that we need to help stop the process of forgetting by making the students create the content with the, um, with the new material they are learning. If they can create class content, they will be more engaged, more likely to remember, and for us as world language teachers, more likely then to keep going um, through the process of learning the language and signing up for that next level. So, as a review, we want students to do things with words. We started with words that are in context. We are studying today neuroscience and how we get students to remember. So we used an article on neuroscience. We connected those words to previous learning by creating those cards. We played with those words with that taboo type game. We then had asked questions with those words. And we did higher order thinking activities with those words by creating questions and doing summarizing. So if you like this presentation and want to look through it a, a little closer, you can. It is at tinyurl.com slash southflank2019, where I originally um, gave this presentation. I hope you have enjoyed it and I hope that you have learned something. And I would also like to thank uh, SCOLT, the Southern Conference on Language Teaching, for um, promoting me to do this presentation. And I would also like to ask all of you, come to SCOLT 21 in Atlanta, March 18th through the, the 20th, so we, you can look at language through an unfiltered lens. And one thanks again to the National Foreign Language Center for allowing me to be part of the 2020 Virtual Summit.